Yo, what's up, listeners? Welcome back to the Axino Zinga Show with me, your host, Agostino. And this is episode number 92. Two, 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 two. Episode 92. Two, 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 two. What up? What's going on? What's good? It's your boy, Agostino. We're back in the place, back in the zone. And I'm feeling amazing. You want to know why? To ask me why. Why, Agostino? Because it's cool again. Fuck, man, it rained last night, the temperatures have dropped, and it feels fucking amazing in London, man. I feel so fucking fresh. And this morning, guess why I'm also extra, extra, doubly, doubly happy? Why is that, Agostino? Because I didn't work out this morning, I took a day off. And I didn't have to shower um, with, um, I didn't have to shower hot. Right, because I don't cool down because I'm a fucking Neanderthal and I come straight back home after a workout and don't take any time to cool down or lower my body temperature before I jump into a shower. So when I do jump into a shower and I pour hot water or any sort of, co- or any sort of cold water or room temperature water over my body, guess what happens? It's like when you're in the sauna and you pour the hot coals, you pour water over the hot coals, isn't it? But thankfully today, that's not happening. Today, I'm cool. Today... I'm cool. Look at me. I'm cool. Look at my glasses. Look at my shirt. Cool. No sweat. Cool. Oh, how good does it feel, man? It's really flipping weird. It's such a mind trip. If someone would have told me last year, right, I'd be, I'd be grateful for a cool, wet, uh, muggy day in London, especially in the middle of August or in the beginning of August. Just the end, just, you know, a few weeks after the end of July. Like, what's I doing? What are you talking about? You know, just uh, <laughs> going up when you say the end of your sentence. Doesn't make much sense, you know? It's like that kind of, um, you know that face that some girls have when they like listen to their mate? Like, oh, that's where it comes from, isn't it? Oh my God, really? No way. You see a lot of that when I walk through Liverpool Street because that's the place where people are, are meeting. They're doing a rendezvous. They're saying goodbye after a long trip. Um, do you know what I mean? There's always that, oh, that fake kind of like oh, ha, pre-holiday friendship shit. I fucking hate friends. You know that? I fucking hate public displays of friendship. Oh, this is my best friend. Fuck you, best friend. Fuck you. Over 25 and you got a best friend? Go jump off a building. All right? Over 25 and public declaring your friendship with somebody? Ah, stab yourself in the eye with a spoon. Um, anyway, regardless of that, right, and this weird uh, mood I've woken up in, honestly, I'm so grateful that it's cool outside. You probably do, can't see it in the video, but I'm pretty sure you guys listening via the audio experience can hear the difference in my voice. Um, I'd ma- I might sound a bit d- groggy. Uh, that's because I decided to stay up uh, up until half past two last night watching Fear Vaughn and Chris Lea videos like a fucking idiot. So I might be a bit hazy. But, you know, because I got a later start and because I didn't work out this morning, it made things pretty okay. So I've had about six hours of sleep. Probably not the best uh, the best sleep in the world. And I'll probably end up hitting a wall sometime later in the evening. But you know what? Sometimes in life, you've got to live by the seat of your pants. Um, and I've also got to do loads of things, I should say. I've got to sort out my playlist for my DJ set tomorrow. DJing tomorrow at Tap East for a night called Tapped. At Tap East tomorrow um, outside Westford Stratford. So if you're in the area, come down. But I've got to, do, I've got to prepare my playlist. Um, I got read, I got catch up on a blog post I didn't do yesterday, like loads of fucking shit, just, you know what I mean, just infecting me brain that I haven't sorted out yet, that I gotta get sorted, um, but yeah, man, I'm just happy it's cool, I'm happy it's cool, I'm happy I can drink a coffee today, right, and not burn up, because the issue I had, um, during the past week, right, so I'd make eggs, I'd make bacon in an oven, which would, you know, heat up the whole entire flat, then I had coffee that's, you know what I mean, piping hot, and I'd be wondering why I'm sweating on camera, or sweating through the microphone. Classic, right? Absolute classic. Classic numb nut move that is. But apart from that, it's been a pretty interesting week. Um, the transfer deadline's about to close on football, right? Um, I've been not paying attention and paying attention at the same time because Man United just depressed me. Man United's probably the most depressing part of my life, you know, the team that support. It's weird because there was a period in time when I when I was supporting United where everyone used to call me a glory hunter because I live in London and I support Manchester Club, right? But if I've, I've not really explained the story, it doesn't really matter who cares, right? But um, <clears throat> when I first came to this country, or no, or when I first was aware of football after I came to this country, so I came to this country when I was about three or four, 
And then I start. I first my first football game I watched. My very first game I watched ever in my life was United v Everton in the FA Cup semi final. Oh, the FA Cup final in nineteen ninety five. And my United lost one nil. And I just wanted to put a red team. wasn't any There wasn't anything to do with nothing. My dad didn't support. My dad actually supported Chelsea. I think during that time. So there might have been a reaction against my dad. What my dad supported, right? Because that's just naturally what kids do. But my little brothers were the same. My little brother, I started supporting my United. My little brother decided to support fucking Arsenal because they had black players in the team. And now he supports Real Madrid. So he's like, you know, he's he's that kind of, you know, he's that kind of YouTube football fans like, yeah, you know, making big noises and you know what I mean, just like pulling silly faces. Like, go fuck yourself. You, is there anything worse than YouTube fan channel? Sometimes some some of them are absolute cancer, aren't they? Like the worst thing in the world, like absolute worst. Um, probably not cancer. Probably that's not a good term, right? People don't like people. People say those kind of things. Well, they're a, they are a pariah, right? They re- they're not they're not a good way of representing f- most football fans uh, for the most part. Let me say that for the most part, football channels. So I ended up supporting my United that way, right? Because I just the first football game I watched was a nine nine five FA Cup final. United lost one nil, and I went to support the red team. Simple as that. But over the period of time, you know, living in London, I kind of did develop a bit of a distaste towards London clubs, especially because most of my friends who who are very talented, or some of them who are quite, ta- or you know, who are okay, weren't really getting any chances with most of these young, um, with most of these uh, local teams, academies, base or, or whatever they may be called, right? Those most, most of these academies had players from all over the country, but London, honestly, like any big major metropolitan city, the amount of kids in London that can play football at a high level is insane. Especially if you go watch any Sunday league game, right? In our um, in the whole of London, for the most part, right? There's some really good players around the team, and it always just bugged me out how most of these sides wouldn't take advantage of the people around them. It's, I guess it's 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 a kind of it's a story that you hear repeated loads of times, right? You always hear a comedian, an artist, a DJ, a rapper, a singer say, "Oh." I actually blew up outside of my area before I blew up in my hometown, right? It's kind of part part of the it's part of the process, right? Um, people don't really appreciate you when you live in an area, but as soon as you blow up and you come back, everyone's kind of on your dick. I kind of I understand that, I get that, but it was kind of frustrating uh, with football being the predominant sport played in amongst inner city area kids, right? Whether they're black, white, whatever. That was one thing that connected us all. You see very talented players going to trials, all these different sides, or you go with them to trial matches and you see players that aren't that good making it because uh, they're fit or their dad is so-and-so person or they have a connection or they used to play for a couple of League One sides. So they'll never sign guys from my ends or guys that I knew my friends, right? So the, the way I, cut, I brought up a real detest towards them. And also during that time too, that was also a weird time where most local teams in England had a weird kind of racist kind of nationalistic front at towards them like good example being Leighton Orient do you know what I mean um, another one being Millwall kind of a bit further out um, kind of Fleetwood being another one a little bit um, and then you've got a few of them like even um, what's the one next to us um, Ilford Right, there was a Clapton as well, Clapton FC, which is around the corner from where I live now, near Forest Gate, their home stadium. Then it's very peculiar, like teams that are predominantly in like very uh, multicultural neighborhoods, right? Um, teams that were kind of spearheaded by people that were from other places originally uh, outside of England, but then they had a very hardened base of nat- nationalistic fans, fans that were part of the EDL, part of BMP. All these sort of weird things. It didn't really make any sense to me at the time. Um, but again, that's something that rubbed you up the wrong way, right? When you're going to watch a game and you've got these like skinheads, like, do you know what I mean? Like chanting, like all sorts of mess towards you before you go to games or you're getting in fights with people. Um, loads of just stupid shit was happening. So I wasn't really a fan of that. So if anything, those experiences kind of made my support of, it kind of um, added fuel to the fire of my support for Manchester United, even though I don't live anywhere near, anywhere near Manchester. Um, I don't have any connections to the city at all, apart from loving the Smiths, right? Um, so whatever, cool. But these last few years, right, has been probably one of the most depressing times to be a United fan, and probably a good thing as well, because it's got rid of all the bandwagon glory hunters that were kind of just there for the glory years, right? Um, post Sir Atlas Ferguson, it's been a fucking shit show, like an absolute shit show. It was like this beforehand, right, during the latter years of Alex Ferguson's tenure, but because you're such a serial winner, and because he was able to squeeze so much out of a, a limited squad of players um for the most part especially towards the end of his time people didn't really pay attention to it and because sometimes united is fair, it's much more interesting for the media and for journalists alike to get in 
um, to get kind of involved with all the backstory stuff with the Glazers and the fucking transfers. No, sorry, not transfers. And uh, Sir Alex Ferguson's horse racing and the scandals around players. They like all that shit. Ryan Giggs sleeping with his brother's wife. Like all that stuff is more entertaining than actual business of the football and how it's run and the lack of and the lack of um, direction our club has, right? And I mentioned before that LeBron James interview where LeBron James is like eulogizing about um, franchises that um, play the decision into why he signed for the LA Lakers and he mentions Manchester United. And that was a good that was a good lit- litmus test to tell you where United stands as a worldwide footballing force. We are respected as one of the four forerunners. Maybe not in social media because you know other clubs have done a better job of us social media wise, but in terms of generating money, generating like cash. We're probably one of the lead figures, in, as an example, for CEOs and chairmen around the world to say, look, you got to do it like that, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, we're, we, we've kind of aced it. US tours, Asia tours, shirt sponsors, um, the things that we do inside the club, um, ambassador programs, um, the kind of giving back to the community stuff, charity work. Like, we are very good at increasing our profile worldwide and also making money. The one thing we absolutely fail, we fail like, we feel like like no other, right? The, the one place that we're fucking shite at, we're the worst at, and it's fucking infuriating. It drives me absolutely nuts, right? This is stuff you won't hear on fucking fan channels where they're like women and iron and beating their chest like gorillas, right? Is we are run, we're not run by footballers. We're not run by football people, right? We have CEOs in footballing positions and we have non-footballers in CEO positions. Like, it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous, right? Um... The business of, of Man United is, is kind of not even that great even for the most part, right? Because we uh, we buy players for an inflated fee. We give them an inflated salary that isn't in line with anything that their uh, like-for-like competitors are getting around the world because we're one of the richest clubs, right? People, Some people come to us. It's like when you go, you go and apply for a job at a big company, right? And you work for like a small startup. When you work for a small startup, maybe you might earn less or maybe you might earn... A consider you know a, a fair market level salary but then when you go to a big um fortune for four fortune 400 500 company your logic in your head is that oh i'm going to be paid more because these guys um generate more right it's just a kind of easy mental maths that you make in your head it might not be true don't get me wrong but for the most part you're like you know what if i make 25 here i'm going to try and make 30 there i'm going to try and make 35 or 40 whatever yeah it's kind of thing that's working in your head it's something that you negotiate during the interview process but we have such a weird way of like jumping people's salary. It doesn't make any sense. Like Ashley Young has been on like 90 to 100 grand a week for the longest time that I can remember since he signed for us from Wolves, right? And this is during an era when 40 million, 30 million for a player, for a winger, like Ashley Young was a lot of money, right? And he was on a lot of money salary wise. And it never quite made sense because then even if Ashley Young, don't get me wrong, Ashley Young is um, kind of. Um, paid back his salary and some because of his performances you know he's someone that probably isn't as gifted as some of the other members of our squad but his application his determination the fact that he's been able to um hang on for dear life and sustain himself and be an integral member of the squad um through successive managers since like for instance left goes to show how much value he brings to the club but imagine if that didn't happen imagine if he just was actually young and he wanted to move him on who do you move him on to if he's on 90 grand a week, who's going to sign him at 32 years old and 90 grand a week? Where's he going to go? Because his salary is going to, it probably won't even get halved. He'll probably get more than half if any other club he goes to. He's not going to get 40 grand a week playing for Bournemouth, is he? Do you know what I mean? It's that kind of ridiculous. So we've got a squad full of players, right, that we can't get rid of because they're on silly money. Valencia, Fellaini, Shaw, maybe in a good example. Young being a good example. Smalling, Jones. I don't know who that's ringing now at the moment, but I, I'm not in, so I'm not going to answer that. Um... Actually, you know what? Let me jump up and see who that might be. Actually, no idea. So I'm just gonna continue ranting. Um, so we have all these we have all these players who haven't necessarily um we haven't necessarily been able to move on, right? Our business is absolutely fucking shoddy, right? We're not we're not doing the best job that we can do with the business of football inside Manchester United and it's just you know it's just honestly it's been one of the most depressing times ever to be a United fan the lack of business um the way the club is run Mourinho's constant sulking like fucking cheer up you miserable piece of oh what is wrong with you man what is wrong with you I guess this is like this 
standard first season syndrome for Mourinho. But if ever there was an example that someone that isn't a fit for a club or isn't fit in general for the modern day football, uh, Mourinho is a good example of it. Since Real Madrid, Ronsi, he's lost some of his spark. I don't know if it's because, you know, he went to Real Madrid and the Real Madrid players weren't having any of his, like, you know, um, small club mentality stuff. You know, his siege mentality shit about everyone's against us. You know, you're Real Madrid, man. You're Galacticos. You, you know and everyone's not against you. You get majority decisions. Sometimes, some people would argue that you might have La Liga um, officials in your pocket, allegedly. Do you know what I mean? Like, that stuff doesn't work there. And supposedly, he went to a change room and some of the big-time players there, like Ramos and a few others, kind of reminded him that he didn't really achieve anything in his professional career as a footballer, so why should they listen to him? Right, kind of call that into question. Something that he's obviously quite sensitive about, it seems like. It's a little chip that he still hasn't got off his shoulder. Um, and he hasn't been able to f shake it. Like, it's just been a constant thing that's been gnawing away at him. Like, consistently. It's been gnawing away at him. He just hasn't been able to shift it. And now we kind of suffer um, the consequences of it. We suffer from it. We suffer because now we have a manager playing. We have a manager that's managing us who kind of always points at others for the faults of the club. A lot of the stuff isn't his pro, isn't his fault. Some of the stuff is stuff that he has kind of inherited, right? He's come in um, off the back of... Um, two disjointed managerial appointments, right? David Moyes and Louis Van Gaal. Louis Van Gaal, um, stylistically and player recruitment wise, and just approach to managing are complete are, are on two different planets, right? So they don't necessarily follow a pattern or a theme. So because of that, some of the player recruitment is a bit, a bit patchy, a bit weird, right? David Moyes inherited players that he probably didn't want. He probably couldn't move. He didn't get enough time to sign the players that he wanted. Then Louis Van Gaal comes in, has to then build on top of a Dijon squad that's also aging. He doesn't really get the time to go and do what he needs to do because he doesn't win the silverware or his, some of his transfers don't work out. Then Mourinho has to come in and try and fix some things. Like, there's a lot of disjointed um, fuck-up shit that's happened in that squad overall that isn't Mourinho's fault, right? Some of it, he has to kind of, like, he has, he has got the benefit of that. He can point at others. But there's a lot of it where it comes to um, enhancing the players that he's got currently in his squad, right? He put so much faith in fucking shite houses like Fellaini, right? An absolute diabolical football, an absolute, um, an absolute, um, anti if, I, if, if ever there was someone that's anti-football, it's Fellaini. Like, absolutely pathetically shit. And even if I was being fair, I'd say, in a good team, right, Fellaini is going to be a good asset. We're not a good team yet. We don't have the luxury of having a Fellaini. Fellaini would probably work better in Man City, in Arsenal, in maybe even Chelsea than he would do it in Manchester United, right? Because we don't even have a good team to utilise a Fellaini even. Because Fellaini in our team is an option to create, right? He's not like a wild card that, that he should be in most teams. Why does someone keep ringing here? What's going on? I have no idea what's going on, but someone keeps ringing. I'm not sure why someone keeps ringing. And I'm, and I'm not here. I'm not in. So I'm going to... So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the door and just continue because, you know, we don't answer the, answer the door when we're not meant to be in. That's not, that's not the vibe. I remember that being a thing when you were... Um, when well, I used to live at home, actually. My parents used to get super suspicious of people with knocks on the door. Like, you never, ever answer the door when you're not, when you're not expecting anyone to um, knock on a door. That probably has to do a lot with, like, running away from debt collectors and shit. You know what I mean? Like, living in the ends and that. You know what I mean? Like, borrowing too much money from catalogue magazines and shit. But, oh. Like I said, man, being a United fan nowadays is one of the most depressing times ever. I'm trying not to pay attention to transfers, but you kind of have to. The whole keep up. Oops, my bad, spot the microphone. The whole keeper, that that uh, goalkeeper has gone from Bilbao to Chelsea, who I haven't really heard of, for 71 million, world record fee. No one really bats an island anymore, isn't it, at world record fees anymore. They don't really, like, um make the news as much as they did back in the day, right? If someone goes for a world record fee back in the day, they'll be like, oh, my God, geez, how many should you go for now? Players, the transfer fee for players no nowadays is fucking nuts. Like, supposedly, Chelsea are going to offload Bakayoko. How much they pay for him? Like, 40-something mil. After two seasons or a season and a half, he's gone. Um, do you know what I mean? Like, Chelsea lose Thibaut Courtois, who throws an absolute mental strop, man. Players are... But I guess, you know, sometimes players have to do that if they really want to move. Like he said, like, his family is based in Spain, I think, right? That's where his daughters are, his family. Because you play for Atletico Madrid, so they're still living in Spain. He's having to commute back and forth. So, for family reasons, he's going to move to Real Madrid. Imagine having to move to Real Madrid for family reasons. What an absolute life footballers have, man. So, he had to, he had to throw his toys out of the pram. 
Because if not, you know, he would have probably got what Riyad Mahrez got when he was trying to force me to, to less from Leicester to Man City. They would just probably held him ransom. So you, I guess you got to do what you got to do. It's a short career. Your, your kids only are young, are that kind of age once, right? I mean, especially to be near them. So I don't really begrudge him for that. But that keeper, keeper, bro. Going, like the keepers have gone for big money. Allison, <clears throat> keeper. Imagine what De Gea is going to be worth now. I get it. He's a bit older. And this keeper dude's about, what, 21, 24, right? Or something along those lines. But what, what's the gay worth? Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but anyway, um, it's the Preston B United fan, like I said. The season starts on Friday against Leicester. Um, it's going to be a difficult game. That's for sure. Re no Riyad Mahrez is probably a, a good advantage. Uh, Vardy's still going to be on fire. You know, he didn't play that much on the World Cup, so he's got quite a bit of a rest. Harry Maguire coming off a good World Cup too. That's another one as well. Harry Maguire. It was pretty obvious that this guy was good. Better than our defenders that we have. We played Leicester a few times. Even the, the season where they where they won 4-1. Um, or 4-2. That, that infamous uh, when uh, Angel De Maria scored that chip. And we thought we were going to bang. No, that was the first game of the season as well, wasn't it? I think it might have been the first game of the season too. Where we were winning 2-0. And then they just crushed us 4-2 on a counter-attack. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, Maguire was playing in that team still. We, we faced Leicester a few times and Maguire's been quite a standout player. I've always kind of liked him. For his, he kind of reminds me a little bit of a really tall John Terry, right? He's very physical, very quick in the tackle, good head on him, um, figuratively and, you know, descriptively. Um, so it's pretty obvious he's going to be a good player and we just didn't go in for him. And now we have to wait for a World Cup. Like, you don't buy... You, that's, that's kind of like transfer 101. You should never buy an England player after a World Cup, especially if the England are paid well, like, English players already are <coughs> overpriced, right? So imagine having to buy an English player after World Cup when they've played well. It doesn't make any sense. So um, I won't be surprised if we pull out that deal. Toby Alderweire is another one we've been, we've been linked with, but he's super injury prone. The same reason, you know, a lot of people have been a bit hesitant on the whole Jerome Boateng loan situation because he's quite cumbersome and he makes a lot of mistakes and he's very injury prone too. But he's, you know, a lot better quality then probably Toby, Aldo, Toby Alderweed and Harry Maguire, I'd argue. But if I was going for a punt, I'd go for Harry Maguire, man, in terms of longevity, in terms of sell-on fee, right? He's English. You can always sell him on for a lot of money later on anyway as, as well. Um, Toby Alderweed at 29, uh, Jerome Burton probably at 28 as well, the age. Like, Mourinho just has that criteria, he? Just, that's why he probably wasn't the best fit for our young players or in our team in general. He's at, you know, he just wants players at a certain age or a certain profile. That's all he can work with. He can't work with anything else. If you're only, if you're 28 or 29, or in that bracket between 27 to 32, that's what he kind of wants to work with. But we have so many young players such as Martial, Rashford, who still have extra potential underneath Mourinho. That's why all that pointing, I'm not really a fan of. For the wrong the club has done to him and has not kind of supported him the way he kind of feels that he should be supported. There's players in that squad now that still have not been utilised. For someone that is such a big fan of Fellaini, how he hasn't been able to get a, the good, a good song out of Martial is ridiculous, really. You know what I mean? So much so that he went, he went, he went ahead and signed Sanchez because he wasn't, wasn't really convinced about Martial's uh, potential, or Martial's ability to kind of fit into the squad. It's just annoying, isn't it? Just fucking annoying. We didn't really need Sanchez. We've got him now. Cool. Um... It's just a very disjointed squad. It doesn't make any sense at front line. The only good benefit I can see from the preseason I've watched, I've, I've tried not to watch it because it's been super depressing, has been Fred. He looks like a good option in midfield. He looks si he doesn't look similar to anyone else we have. He probably might be a step up to in quality to someone like Ander and Herrera, who I still think is uh, good enough to play for us. I'm sorry. If you have a manager that knows what he's doing, I'm sure they can make that work. Um, and then Andres Pierre, 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 who's come back on loan from Valencia. He's looked amazing too, actually. He's looked very up for it. And he might be another good like-for-like -like replacement for like a one matter if he decides to kind of go in the way in during the season. But yeah, man, it's been a fucking horrible, horrible transfer window. And I can't wait for it to be over. And if I'm completely honest, I can't wait for the day until Mourinho leaves Manchester United. Now, I'm not sure who's going to replace him. I'm not sure who's out there. But I can't wait to the day that he leaves Man United and we take a step back and hire a footballing director or get some sort of football people involved in the club and actually turn the boat around. Because if it's just a process of sacking Mourinho and then hiring, I don't know, and then promoting Michael Carrick or getting in Zidane or something, I don't think that's a good idea. We need to have football people in this club to kind of like make that thing run like an actual football club. So we actually are recruiting certain types of profile players. So, we, so there's a pattern. 
to our signings. But at the moment, it doesn't make any sense. M Man City signed Riyad Mahrez. That makes all the sense, right? To some people, it might not because they're like, oh, you've already got one, you've already got one international player there in Leroy Sane. He was amazing. Why would you sign Mahrez? It's football. Jeremy, you, know I you never know what might happen in the season. Benjamin, Benjamin Medi, they signed for a lot of money and he ended up fucking up his cruise ship. Do you know what I mean? And Kyle Walker played a lot more than he was probably meant to play. So you never know what's going to happen with players and injuries and all that sort of malarkey. So you always got to account for that stuff. But I would, I'd guess if you look at my United's transfers, you don't really see any pattern. There's no pattern of the way we buy. There isn't. There's never been a pattern. It's just sporadic. It's just who's good at that time. Um, signing someone so other people don't sign them. It's, there's no real pattern. There's no real rhyme. The last kind of pattern or style of play I saw that you could tell that we were planning, trying to sign players was probably under Marine, probably under Van Gaal. He had a kind of profile player that he wanted, right? In the kind of daily blend, um, Anthony Martial. Do you know what I mean? Football players. Do you know what I mean? Like close to feet, one, two touch. Like you could see what he was kind of going for. Um, but yeah, that didn't work out, obviously. So let's see what happens. I'm, I'm really not looking forward to the season. I can't see us finishing anywhere within the top three, personally. Um, playing that kind of negative style of football, it's not going to happen. Especially with only Rashford and Lukaku up front. No Martial, no other option. Sanchez will have to really hit the ground running. Lukaku will score again 25 to 30 goals. Uh, Rashford need, will need to pick up a lot and really kind of contribute a lot to the kind of goal scoring. Pogba, as you've shown in the World Cup, isn't going to be a goal scorer, but will be a driving force. But he still needs a team around him to kind of facilitate that. And whether or not he has that or not is another, is another thing to talk about. So it's going to be a very difficult season. All the other teams around us have improved. They've got new managers. Some of them are unproven. You know, Unai Emre, uh, Sarri at Chelsea hasn't, has played good football at Napoli, but hasn't won a jack shit. So that's someone that could uh, fly to deceive. Um, you know, Emery might not be able to might not be able to stop the rot that's invested in Arsenal. You know, years and years of being perennial losers and Arsenal Wenger kind of like you know um, ruining his legacy by hanging on to a job that he probably should have let go a long time ago and kind of instilling a kind of like you know lack of winning mentality within an Arsenal team might be too far gone. You never know. I'm more hopeful with the stuff. Man City, of course, are going to win. Are going to run the league again. Do you know what I mean that's that's obvious? So if you're a betting guy, you might as well bet on Man City winning the league. And if you're a betting guy that wants to win big bucks, maybe bet on maybe Liverpool winning it again. You never know. They might actually sneak up again because they've, they've signed a few good players off of you know, and everyone else. Some very good profile players. Sturridge is coming back, even though that's, you know, Sturridge coming back isn't really a big deal because he's probably going to get in. Not touch wood, he doesn't get injured, but, you know, his injury record hasn't been the best of the seasons. Um, I don't wish that on him, but, yeah, man. As you can tell, my mood's kind of dipped as well after speaking about Man United. Man, absolute horror show of a football club. So I'm not looking forward to a new season. And it is what it is. What can you do? Anyway, let's jump onto some topics because I don't want to talk about this shit anymore. Um, Demi Novato breaks her silence. Actually, you know what? Let's go first with this because this made me laugh. Diversity is good, right? Let me get this up on the screen. Hopefully, you guys can see this. Uh demonstration so um should i give you a backstory in this clip or should i just let you play it and just play it out maybe i'm just gonna let it play out actually um i thought this was really funny you know it was good to find little videos on youtube that make you giggle a little bit um so i'm gonna play this you should hear this via the audio um via audio so if you're listening on audio just briefly describe the video this is a uh, illinois governor uh bruce rayner drinks chocolate milk to show how diversity is really good a fucking very bizarre video that could only occur in um um, America and just goes to show how fucking whacked up w race relations are in America that they fought a governor right someone that's elected by public office someone that's elected to the public office sorry um, by his constituent thought this would be a good idea to kind of do in front of them right um, I'm going to play it out loud now <clears throat> Fortune Hall represents corporate America, Fortune 500 companies. It's not that organizations, and if you look at any corporate website and look at its leadership team, you'll see all white men, a few white women, and just maybe an Asian in technology. This chocolate serve represents diversity. Women, people of color, people with disabilities, the aging population, Generation X, Y, and Z. It's not that organizations are not diverse, but when you look at most organizations, diversity sits what? At the bottom of the organization. You don't get inclusion until you actually stir it up. I want you to stir it up, Governor. Stir it up. Diversity is the mix, and inclusion is making the mix work. 
And it actually tastes pretty good. I'm not going to ask the governor to drink it because it may not be good, but it does taste good. I'll drink it. I'll You'll drink it? To. He'll be proud, too. There you go. So diversity it's is... It's really, really good. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> diversity is really good using chocolate milk. You know what, right? Honestly, like some of these, some of these things, like some, a lot of it has to do with just being in America, probably. Like race relations are weird, but I love, I, I love these videos, right? Because I just want to be in the room. Because you guys, right? I'm sure if you've worked in any sort of place where you've handled production, or you worked in a company where you're working in the service industry and they kind of want to run by you a new menu options or they want to run by you maybe a promotion or let you know something that they're thinking of doing in the future or if, if, you, if you just worked in social media and marketing and stuff you know these meetings right are kind of a bit idiotic sometimes where it's a round table and everyone's voice is is, is uh equally as weighted Every, everyone's voice is as equal amount of, of weight right but but you know deep down some people meeting after meeting chat the most shit right they just talk shit they don't necessarily have any good ideas. Their way of their their good idea is just being an objector, right? Just constantly throwing up questions about why this can't work and why this can't work. Sometimes it's good to have that in a room, but if that's your only um, um, contribution, then I question the uh, your interpretation of what ideas are, right? Don't get me wrong, I question it. And then also there are rooms where you sometimes sit in there because you're in there for so long, everyone just gets a bit twisted right and start saying stupid shit you've been in the room before where you start throwing out dumb suggestions and because you've been in the room so long you just want to get the fuck out right um you just start yesing stuff that you wouldn't really yes in the normal set circumstances so you've been there right but i'd love to be in a room where where someone is pitching the idea of during a talk when you're talking about uh, diversity in a in the workforce or diversity in in a fucking uh, fortune 500 company where you think it's a good idea to pour a glass of white milk in a glass on stage, add some syrup in it, and re that represents diversity. You stir it, shake it around, that makes it good, and then drink it. And then have the guy say, it's really, really good, into a fucking microphone. It's really, really good. What the fucking fuck is going on? <laughs> like, what is this? Honestly. Like, that kind of diversity is fucking shit anyway, right? Like, you know, as Jordan Peterson says, and I kind of, and I 100% agree, stating somebody just based on their colour is horrible, right? Especially for the person that gets selected. Especially when it's a job that is high stakes or that requires a certain level of experience or expertise, right? And you just are hired for your, um, because of your background, um, because of your colour, race, creed, sexuality, whatever. When you're hired and you've got to do that job Monday to Friday and you're fucking up and you know your shit, and you know, you've only, you only got hired because you're a boy or a girl or because you're black or you're white, you're the one that loses in the long term because you might have to leave the job after a while because you're not doing well. And then that might then hamper the company productivity or that might hamper everyone else's chances that come, might come after you, right? So you have to hope that when you do diversity that way, forced diversity, that that person is a fucking killer. I, 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 saw, I saw Zedenia mention it um, a few weeks ago on Twitter. She was like, oh, you know, being a person of color, POC, the fucking weird term they use in america you know um those kind of labels they put on themselves she was like oh being a poc you have to always kind of um you have to always kind of uh what's that word called like jamie fox says about being black in hollywood you have to bring your a game all the time or your a star game right you can't afford to be uh 80 percent you have to come because your chances aren't that many which just makes sense isn't it like it's not I guess it's not a black thing. It's just you know generally a minority thing because there's not that many roles of minority in Hollywood for for the most part, right? Because most of the Hollywood production companies are run by people that no, I don't know. It's just a general numbers for game, right? So it makes sense that not a lot of people will get opportunities, especially if you're if it's dude acting and you look a certain way. You don't have a a general average Joe face, right? Your particular look. It only makes sense that when you do get opportunity to kind of fucking hear out the part because you might not get another one another two days. But that doesn't mean. That represents bigotry or that may represents the patriarchy as evil. That just means that the opportunities for your role of someone that looks like you aren't plentiful. Maybe there should be. Who knows? But whatever. So I mean, I, I know he, she kind of mentioned it. Zedania mentioned, oh, yeah, being in Hollywood and her being a Disney actress. She feels like she she has it, it's there's more oh, there's more pr pr pressure on her. Right. To be good, to be fucking amazing. She can't afford to go into um, things half high because people already have a preconception of her being a Disney actress. And da, 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 da. cool. No problem. But again, you have to hope that the person you're hiring 
when you're pirating them based on what they have in between their legs or the color of their skin, you kind of hope they have to be killers, right? Because they're not killers and they come into it shit. Then it, have, it fucks everyone else up that comes behind. It fucks them all up. And I think I've said that a few times to a few people that I know, especially a few couple of DJ girls that I know, and especially to a couple of other girls that are kind of like internet kind of socialized or kind of want to be that figure right who are kind of pretty i've told them right ride the fucking coattails of the fact that you're pretty or that you're hot or that you speak a few languages right and you do the skill but also be good at what you do because what generally happens most people that are out there right most people that are kind of trying to make it or the most the people that everyone's kind of looking towards as the kind of idols they're the ones who are just like kind of all face no talent or all face kind of a bit of talent but if you're able to go in there, I think, in my opinion, if you're able to go into a room and use the fact that you're a POC or the fact that you're in a wheelchair, the fact that you have a disability, another disability, the fact that you um, have a se- kind of a sexual orientation, the fact that you have very weird political, whatever it is, if, if you're able to use it to your advantage, right, to kind of squeeze your way in, but you're also good at what you do, you fucking killed it. That's playing a game, right? Because unfortunately, these fucking diversity diversity warriors like this guy with a fucking uh, glass of milk thinks just hiring a bunch of women do you know what I mean, to be part of the council is going to solve um their uh misogyny in the office right no nah, that's not going to do that do you know what I mean if anything it's going to make it worse like well, what the fuck is this but that is just nuts to see how they treat race relations in, in the u.s like a black... <laughs> this represents 4500 companies is that like, what what the fuck is going on man Especially in Fortune 500, I'd, I'd imagine there is maybe some hint of that, right? The kind of boys club, right? The kind of idea like, you know, people hiring people based on... You, you see a lot on Parliament, right? A lot, of, a lot of MPs are, you know, former students of Eton, all that sort of shit. But I'd, I'd imagine in the Fortune 500 company, where it's primarily based on the bottom line, right? Generating income. I'd imagine there are tons, tons of bigots and racists inside Fortune 500 companies who kind of just suppress it all keep it all the way down, swallow, swallow it inside, right? They might have some fucking really horrible anti-Semitic stuff to say about some of their colleagues or racist shit. They might have some fucking abhorrent stuff to say to some of their colleagues, but they suppress that shit. They pack it all in because it's about money. It's a Fortune 500 company. You don't care, right? I, I, I swear, I'd imagine so. Again, maybe I'm naive. I don't have any experience working in a 500 company. I don't work in finance. I don't know these things, right? Maybe I'm super naive, but I would imagine... If you do work in a Fortune 500 company, I'd imagine you do not give a fucking fuck if that person is a boy, girl, gay, straight, black, white. You do not care. If they can generate you more income, if they can give you more money on your bonus every week, every month, right? Allow you to go on more holidays, allow you to hire more strippers, uh, get more prozies, do more lines of coke, uh, buy a better car, buy a better suit. All your materialistic um, fucking uh, desires are being met. If they're able to do that, why would you care? What did you wouldn't care? So this idea that somehow um, it's a bad thing that most of these companies are white, right? Because maybe they attract a certain group of people is bizarre. The fact that you're gonna introduce quotas into a, a an industry that is primarily based on um, what you call it uh, non opinion based results, right? It's just numbers game, right? At the end of the day. Because that's, that's where all the headhunters come in, right? And jacking talent from other companies, uh, people that are doing amazing and just getting them in because, hey, you've been here a year and you've generated them this amount, come to our company. Like, it's just bizarre. I don't know, man. Registrations in America are just fucking weird. And it made me think the other day of, like, you would never get it in here in America, but some woman on, on the Facebook group that I follow, a page um, for my area, she was talking... It made me laugh. It shouldn't. Don't get me wrong. It's really bad to say that I laugh, but... Um, this woman spoke speaking about uh, how she got um, assaulted or nearly got assaulted sitting in her car. She, I think she was parked up somewhere near sitting in her car waiting for someone. And then some, uh, actually written a thing, I was sitting in my car waiting for a friend, my windows down because uh, it was really warm. And then a black man came, a black man with gloves on and a knife came and tried to put a knife to my neck. And I was like, whoa, but the thing that really caught me off guard and made me chuckle was the fact that she just went straight. Like it was, I think it was like two lines. It was like sitting in my car, waiting for a friend, a black man. Do you know what I mean? Straight in black man. Like, and it made me laugh because like that's something that you wouldn't really hear in America. They'll kind of like, you know, skirt around it. Like, you know, African-American, you know, they'll, they'll kind of say, you know, someone of a dark complexion. You know what I mean, they don't, they wouldn't want to say the black thing because they, they feel weird about it. 
But we don't give a fuck here. We don't give a flying fuck here. It was that black dude over there, that big black one there. He did it. Jesus Christ. And just a, just a vision of some crackhead, right? With gloves on and a knife trying to jack some woman in her car with, with I don't know, with a fucking, probably a kitchen knife, right? In, in mid-afternoon. It's just hilarious. Like, that's only a crackhead d- d- type of robbery. He put on gloves to not put fingerprints, but he had, a, he, he had his bare face out so for the woman to spot him. Like, what in the fucking hell is going on here? Like, oh, this area is the best. Honestly, it's the gift that keeps on giving. It really is the gift that keeps on giving. Oh, he's got gloves and he's trying to jack a woman with a butter knife. It's like, what? Oh, God almighty. Um, anyway, on top of that, Demi Lovato breaks her silence. Demi, Demi L, um, the lady that kind of, um, kind of captured everyone's attention on social media the other week, even though I can't name one single song of hers. She's a, that, that's, there are pop stars like this that exist, isn't it, right? There's pop stars like this to exist who are insanely popular, but you can't name a single song. Because the, the, over here, there's Taylor Swift, but then she has some sort of like, she's kind of, see, she's kind of slipped through my net because of her controversies with like Kanye West and all that sort of shit. Like you've kind of been able to hear some of her stuff. And plus a lot of people use Taylor Swift as like a way. Some people say they're fans of Taylor Swift to illustrate that they're kind of, you know, I'm not that hard, man. I like Taylor Swift, you know what I mean? To give them a kind of fun comedic side. Like, oh, I don't know. You know, it's like kind of those when girls meet each other at Liverpool Street Station. Oh, oh really? Oh, you know, it's like, oh, I like Taylor Swift. I'm not that hard. Cool. Congrats, brother. Well done. Um, so it's that's fucking annoying. But there are those pop ups that do exist out there who are, you know who they are? Like a Jon- Jonas Brothers. I can't name you a single Jonas Brothers song. Or if they, if, if, do they both make music together? I don't know. Um, what, they look like they make music, especially the one that's got a bald head now. He looks like he plays the guitar, I think, right? Maybe I'm wrong. People are shouting at me through their headphones. Uh, but it's weird, isn't it? A pop artist that exists that you know who they are, but you don't know a song they do. I guess I must be. I guess that must be similar to some of the people that might see an NBA player because they they take pictures of their outfits and shit, but they don't know what team they play for, right? So you might see a LeBron James in a Tom Brown suit or Kyrie Irving wearing whatever, but you have no idea what team he plays for. It's a very interesting time to to be in, isn't it? Where you're known for one thing, you're known for your visibility as opposed to what you do. Unless people, and then how would they give it? So then how would I be converted? I wonder that. How, how would that go in my head? How how would I go from a point of saying, "Oh, I know she is. She's that singer girl," to then going, "Oh, let me check out what she does." I don't know where that crossover comes, but it hasn't come anywhere. So I didn't have no idea what song she makes. But you know, um, everyone on the internet was kind of crying for her because she decided to take too many drugs one day and um, had a had some complications, which is interesting, right? The whole drug thing with some celebrities, with some, not all. Some celebrities, I guess because they present this cookie cutter image, when they do drugs, it's kind of seen as like, a, oh my God, the pain she must be going through. When really, can't someone just like be honest and say, I like, getting to, I like, I like to get fucked up. Can I just be, no. It's, I've, the, the, hey, 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 let's, let's take a step back. There's no pain here. I'm Demi fucking Lovato. There's no pain, right? My mum's been sorted out. My dad's sorted out if he's around. Brothers and sisters are sorted out, right? Money for days, looks for days, right? Um, hardcore fans, right? I'm good. Might be some internal strife here and there from boyfriends and girlfriends I've broken up with. Cool, that shit happens, everyday occurrence in life. But, you know, I'm all right. And I just like to get fucked up. Some people like to go to Turks and Caicos and post pictures of their feet in a fucking infinity pool while they're on their mobile phone, right? But I like to get fucked up. It might, why can't I just say that? But I guess when you've got that, when you present one face, one image of yourself, right? You can't then have this other image. Because naturally people will say, oh, that other image is like chaos though. That's like chaos. But yes, that's what life is, right? Order and chaos. Come back to Jordan Peterson again. It's that yin and yang, right? It's that kind of like, yeah, that yin and yang, whatever that symbol is. Right? It's that kind of that snake thing, right? That's what it is. It's order and chaos. Like you're meant to have both things. But some, some, for some reason, some people are like to have it, some people aren't. And there's that idea, like, again, a Demi Lovato thing as if, like, you know, it was an overdose. What? It can't have just been an, a crazy night. Like, we've all done it. We've all got blackout drunk before. You, you can get blackout high. I'm pretty sure you can. It's not an overdose. You just, got, you just got too fucked up. And luckily, because you're... Luckily, because you're an artist and shit, when you fall asleep, people get the ambulance and take you to hospital. Do you know what I mean? But when, when, when you fall asleep at home or you, you're too fucked up, you just lie on the bed and your girlfriend fucking shakes you in the morning. 
or pours water all over your face. You know what I mean? Like, you don't get that benefit. So you should get up because you promised that you, you were, you're going to go take her for a 14-pound avocado on toast. So you don't get that. You don't get that benefit. You know what I mean? But they, they do. And it's just a strange world, I think. But anyway, she posted uh, a, a, a comeback. I'm back on social media posts. Everyone does this, isn't it? It's like the kind of like, it's the post that you make after you make a mistake in public, after um, you've kind of gone in hiding and you want to make a, you want to make a return. Um, when you want to clarify some news that's been spread across social media, there's this thing in it. And I've, I, I'd imagine, it, do you think iOS have developed, you know, I, in iOS notes, do you think they've developed it to a size, presumably when you crop it, that it automatically fits into the box, the 1080 by 1080 box with Instagram? That'd be a good little fitting, isn't it? Or some sort of plugin that works, that can kind of like proofread. Or there should be an app, maybe a notes app kind of, that kind of will give your statement a PR twist. Like, um, you know, I'm listening, you know, that kind of, those, all those phrases, like when you, when people get caught for sexual assault, um, I just want everyone to know that I'm listening. Um, I'm going to take time to listen, reflect on my mistakes, build, grow, uh, pray, all that sort of sh bullshit, right? Um, anyway, Demi Vata posted one the other day and her one was pretty interesting to read. Um, again, just because, you know, some people are, are allowed to make mistakes, some people aren't. Um, and it reads, I have always tried, I've always been transparent about my journey with addiction. What I've learned is that Ill this illness is not something that disappears or fades with time. It's something I must continue to overcome and have not yet done. I want to thank God for keeping me alive and well. To my fans, I am forever grateful for all your love and support throughout this past week and beyond. Your positive thoughts and prayers have helped me through, have helped me navigate through this difficult time. I want to thank my family, my team, and the staff at Cedars Sea Now, who have been by my side this entire time. Without them, I wouldn't have been here writing this letter for you all. I, need, I now need time to heal, focus on my sobriety and road to recovery. The love you all have shown me will never be forgotten. And I look forward to the day where I can say I come out on the other side. I will keep fighting. Keep fighting. Like, come on. You like to get high and you just can't control it. Keep fighting. Like, Jesus Christ. I don't know. Uh, these kind of celebrity addictions are kind of similar to me. Like, everyone having mental health issues. Like suddenly everyone's got a mental health issue. Oh, are you sure it's, there is no like coincidence that the, the fucking advent of smartphones, uh, the prominence of social media within our society and the fact that the landscape of celebrity, the, 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 the kind of, the, um, what you call it, the distance between uh, us and celebrities has been flattened because of social media. So you're able to see directly what someone's doing at that particular, in real time, right? So of course, sometimes it can be the highlights of their life and don't get me wrong, sort of representative of their true life, but you can see what they're doing. You can see what your peers are doing. You can see what people two years above and two years under you are doing. And sometimes even, even, even to greater exaggerations, right? That probably lends itself more to mental health issues than uh, the fact that people have general mental health issues, right? And the fact that everyone's kind of growing up at the same sort of time on the internet. But no, everyone has mental health issues. No, you don't have mental health issues. You just realized now that after spending four years in university and now you're working retail and the job that you fucking hate, that maybe you made the wrong career decision and you're bummed out about it. That isn't mental health issue. I'm sorry, that isn't. It just isn't. It's too loose of a term. Mental health issue. Like, is that sexual assault? What does that mean? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, huh? Like... Aziz Ansari is like being blacklisted the same way Harry Harvey Weinstein is. Don't get me wrong, Aziz is a creepo. Like, do you know what I mean? Don't, hey, for, for one, don't stick your hand down someone's throat. Fucking weird. Don't get me wrong. Super creepy. And that whole account was, if that girl's society is to be believed, what she read about Aziz, like, you know what I mean? She's the worst date in the world. But should it be vilified the same as Harvey Weinstein? Nah, probably not, right? Probably different levels of um, punishment for each individual person. The same way that not all mental health are the same. Like, I'm sorry. Because you just haven't figured out what you want to do in your life doesn't mean you have a mental health issue. Because all your friends have their life in order and you don't doesn't mean you have a mental health issue. And because you're a celebrity and you like to get fucked up doesn't mean you have an addiction. It might just mean you like drugs. Have you, t have you figured that one out? N anyone? No? Maybe you just like getting fucked up. Just temper it. I don't know. What? Figure it out. There's people that do lines of coke every day. Every fucking day, and they work a nine-to-five. Don't get me wrong. Hmm. I wonder. Compar comparatively, what's more difficult? Being a pop star or working a nine-to-five? Like, mentally, physically. Like, I, I know, even if it's just sitting on a laptop, don't get me wrong. But I, I wonder what is more difficult. Especially for, and I'm saying for the, not for the person that sees 
the pop star realm or nine to five realm as their vocation. Not as a person that kind of like, oh, I've always wanted to work for Uber. I love working for Uber. Do you know I mean? Not that kind of person. I'm talking about a person that's working a job just because it's a job and the person who is working, who's a pop star just because they can sing or because they're pretty. They, but they just don't care about the industry. They're doing it primarily for a job. I wonder what's more difficult of the both, or of those two. What's the harder thing to do? Be a pop star or work a nine to five? I don't know. But I'd imagine the, the, the time, again, because I value time, right? And I fucking hate the fact that I have to jet off in a minute and get to, and get to work. Like, I've, got, I've got to be somewhere at a particular period of time and I've got to block that time out and I've got to come back and I've only got this small window left for me to do what I want to do. It's fucking annoying, right? Which is why I eventually want to go do my own thing. So that's the way I'd say being a pop star is easier because with work, you have these blocks of time that you can't escape. Whereas when you're an artist, you have blocks of time spread across time. So you might have two hours here for rehearsal. You might have some studio time here. You might have an interview. You might have inter But you have time in between time to do your own thing. You're not just blocked out for seven hours or eight hours, whatever it may be. But I, I do wonder because, like I said, there's people in big cities in London working sometimes not even uh, not even guys in the finance department who are like, you know, high pressure jobs running around, guys and girls in pencil skirts and shit. No, no, no. And, and you know what I mean? Guys in business suits, girls in uh, really sharp pencil skirts. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this. I bet there's general people just getting fucked up on MDMA, on care, on coke, on whatever, on alcohol. I see them sometimes when I go and sit in the park and I, and I go read a book uh, towards the end of my shift. I see people in the park just like, you know, have, having a joint after work, like every day. Do you know what I mean? And, I've, you know I, mean? and I know if I have a joint one time, um, during the week sometimes it can fuck me up the entire week i get super groggy so i can only imagine how it must make these guys feel right they're fucking warriors and people do it they balance it can't you just say you like drugs it's like such a weird society we live in right social media was meant to be the thing where you were able to represent your best self right and i think gary vaynerchuk mentioned it the other day that that was a, probably the saddest thing about the whole demi lovato anthony bourdain being the same sort of thing that was the saddest part about all these things is that people go through so much shit to keep up one image of their life, right? That you have no idea what they're actually going through if you look, if you only look at the social media platform. No one knew Anthony Bourdain was going to kill himself. You, there's no, there's no indication at all on your social media platform that he had any sort of like he was going through any dark times, right? And you have, a, and you have that kind of who's that um, Mike Righteous guy on, in in England, right? Who kind of you know went on a bit of a rant and kind of pretended he was going to kill himself, and his friend played into it. Usually people that have real suicidal thoughts or mental illnesses don't even give any warning signs, right? Like that um, um, Olympic snowboarder for England who killed herself on her 18th birthday. On her birthday, no one knew. Just, just ended it. Like, do you know what I mean? Like crazy shit, right? So the sad thing for me is that you don't really see people's pain on social media. You don't see it. They don't, they're not vulnerable enough. And I guess I think that's where the next... That's, where, that's, where, that, that's probably why someone like Drake wins. Again, just, just to get really meta on this right that's why someone like drake wins because for someone so big right he's very vulnerable mostly through his music because he doesn't really speak to the media he's not really big on interviews um he's, he runs a really tight ship but when it comes to music he's <clears throat> very very open and um, so much so <clears throat> that <clears throat> the meme about drake, drake being soft <clears throat> has been permeated in the industry mostly it's through it's, it's through his own fault like it's through his own fault like it's, through, it's, it's his own doing that is how drake is soft things happen because he constantly talks about his heart getting broken going through a girl's phone like shit that guys don't necessarily admit right in these insecurities he's open with it he says out loud nah i'm i'm in my feelings right now do you know what I mean? like uh for lack of jeremy you know I mean? excuse the pun so i think maybe that might be the next big step for the next big pop star like the the fucking nutty one is a person that's like like Demi Lovato, like a Taylor Swift, but is really open, like super, like nauseatingly so open. You know that kind of honesty in public that it can, kind of makes you cringe. Like Jesus Christ, man, because everyone's doing it anyway. Do you know what I mean like when someone gets when someone gets assaulted or when someone gets insulted or when someone gets attacked in real life, everything's done in public. Nothing's done over the phone. Nothing's done like, hey man, you're you're going crazy on Twitter. Like chill out, stop talking about me. Nothing's done. Nothing's mediated one to one. Everyone's everything's done in public anyway. So why not have someone that's just like that on steroids? Do you know what I mean? That's just fucking honest to a, to a fucking fault. He or she. That might be the next big step because that's a sad, that's a sad part of Demi Lovato. No one saw it coming. Her addiction. And like I said, like is it addiction? Can she can she just not be a fan of drugs and kind of function? 
Where's where's the rock? Where's where are the rock and roll stars, man? This is what it is. You know what I mean, she's Demi Lovato. She tours. I'm I'm gonna say 300 days in a year, right? She's the big star. I have I don't know. I can't name a song of hers. Don't get me wrong, but you know, like she's massive. Like, what do you expect her to do? Especially at that age. Like, you look at Mick Jagger, who came on a Joe Rogan podcast a few weeks ago or a few months ago. And look how, you know, how fucked up he is. He's clean now, but you can, you know, he's still, you know, when the people say like when someone stops doing PEDs in sports and they, and they, but they're still a bit like dubious about their performances because they'd be like, you know, you still got that residue left in your system. It's like when you get, um, it's like when you relax your hair and it goes back to <laughs> after a period of years, but it goes back to normal hair. It's never really back to normal Afro. You still got the residue of like, you know, you still got the benefits of when you permed it back in the day. So I don't know. I'm just shocked, man. I'm just shocked that people can't just be rock stars and just live a life and just get fucked up. But again, maybe g generally people that still have a hung up on drugs anyway. O of course they probably do. But hey, she's a rock star, man. Let her be a rock star. But yeah, I guess get well soon. I guess she's going to be all right. She'll figure it out. Next album will be massive as always. What's, what's this? I, I, I say this and I started laughing in the, in the comments. I wonder what this is. Uh, this man. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There are things in life that make you laugh and there are things in life that just make you sing and you want to just rejoice because they're so funny that you can't get over how funny they are, right? It's like, what the fucking fuck, right? And this is one of those videos, right? It just made me laugh absolutely uncontrollably and I really hope it makes you laugh too. I'm going to try and minimize this screen a little bit so it's not as big. Let me try and get it over here. Hold on. Can I minimize this a little bit? There you go. It's smaller there. Put there. There you go. So I'm gonna play this video. Hope you guys find this funny. <laughs> Holy shit! If you're listening via the podcast, please go on YouTube and check this out. I'll put a link below so you guys can check out my video portion of the podcast. But essentially, it's called Speedboat Crash with, St with seven passengers. Right? It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. You know why, right? Because this reminds me when we went to we went to uh, the brunette and I went to uh, Fort Ventura, right, in Little Island um, in Spain, right, for our summer holidays last year, and we got on a boat to go to another island that had this massive, amazing lagoon, like just fucking rock star life shit, right? And a similar thing happened on the way. So it just reminds me of seeing her face fucking ri uh, ricocheted off the side of a boat. <laughs> anyway, let's continue this. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! Holy shit! Oh god! Holy shit! Holy moly! Honestly, it's the best stuff I've ever seen in my whole entire life. <laughs> you know you know what makes it even funny is just how pretty these ladies look right their little their little bikinis the guys on with their great little oakley wraparound glasses everyone just looks like so fucking cool and then you can see the terror in their faces as it starts going <laughs> <laughs> and quickly right why do these boats never have fucking adequate um uh grips on the side so you can hold your hold with the other one we went on when we was in Fred Ventura, right? They had these grips that were fucking ripped off, that like people were yanking onto them. There's no like, there's no bars. There's like a couple here, but there's or maybe, maybe because you're only meant to have five people in the bar in the in the speedboat, right? Maybe that's why. But why isn't there extra grips inside this first ladies to hold onto? Oh, continue, continue, continue. Hold oh, on. She's so pissed. <laughs> oh god oh why oh, is it so funny already man jesus christ oh. 
I've got to take a HP tablet. Oh god, my nose is running. Look at them going already. Look at the fear. Look at that. Look at her on the right hand side. <laughs> They're going to the green. Look at the fear on her face. Oh god. Oh. <laughs> Holy shit. Holy fucking shit. Holy shit. <coughs> Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh! Oh! Oh god! You guys have to watch this video! <laughs> you know what's worse, right? Because your eyes are always on the lady that has her. It's kind of bruised up her fingernails because she was holding onto the leather seats. And the guy that had the most confidence was acting like it. Yeah, it's ain't no big deal. Little girl's making a big deal out of it. The driver, he's the one that gets absolutely fucking boom on the side of the. Oh, he gets absolutely railed on the side of the fucking speedboat. He gets it the worst. Look at this. So they're going right. Look at him. Look at him. Right. He's got his shirt on and his little gloves. Look. He's driving the thing and he just gets bang, good douche. And then they go boom, boom. Holy fuck! Absolute scenes, man. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 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 fucking let the bodies hit the floor. Let the bodies hit the. Oh, oh my god! Holy fuck! Oh, Jesus Christ, my eyes, man. Oh, they got absolutely smashed, man. Fucking hell. F <coughs> please, please, I beg of you to watch this video. I honestly implore you, please watch this video. Speedboat crash with seven passengers. I'm going to link it in the show notes so everyone can check it out. But I swear to God, if you enjoy it, if you love... <coughs> Oh god. Had to do that, sorry. If you love, right? Um that's that was that was nasty, right? Fucking Fleming into a mug. That's nasty! I don't care. If you love, right, seeing girls fall over as much as I do, please watch this video. You will love it! Oh god! Oh my fuck, cause honestly, your whole entire time, every time I watch this video, I've watched it back probably seven hundred times, right? Every time I watch this video, the girl in green, right, who kind of bruised her finger, it's like, ow, my finger, I mean, ow, ow, you know, that kind of girl, no, sorry, the one in the purple bikini, uh, sitting there holding her head, right, ow, ow, you out, you out, you're laughing a lot because you're like, you have no idea what kind of pain you're actually going to be in, right, forget the girly cute pain where you're like, oh, it hurts, you're hurting me, you know, when you touch a girl's arm, it's like, ow, like, fuck you, right, not that girly pain. You, you, you have no idea what kind of pain you're going to be in. So your, your eyes are glued onto this girl, right? But it's not her you have to keep on your eye on. It's the guy who's acting like it's no big deal with his fucking, I mean, Oakley's wrapped around and he's good driving the thing. You know what I mean? He's got no care in the world. He's not caring. Oh, these girls are complaining. Oh, sissies. Oh, they don't. I mean, he's got this fucking machismo face on his bald head. And he's the one that gets fucking knocked out. Like, boom, boom. He's out cold. Still out, I think, now. I think he's still out in the video. I think he's still out on the floor. Is anyone helping him? No, no one's helping him. No one's helping him. He's still on the floor. <laughs> and it reminds me so much of her. When me and the Bruno went on a holiday, she, and the, the fucking thing was going up like this. Like it kept skidding up as it was kind of going in the water. And she was getting so pissed off because she was get, just getting banged along the whole thing. And then when we left and we got, when we kind of docked um, and we kind of came off the boat, she went off on a fucking Spanish tirade to the drivers and everyone was laughing. Well, I, w I wasn't laughing because, you know, I can't laugh. You know I mean, when the brunette's going off, I have to kind of, you know, I kind of got to back the beef in it. Like, well, what are you laughing at? Do you know what I mean? I kind of, even though I'm laughing, even though I'm like, you know, I'm busting up inside. I've got to kind of back the beef. But, oh. Oh god, that might be a good place to end it actually. <laughs> ah! It's absolute best. Oh, excuse me, but honestly, I swear to god, it's absolute best. I love it. Girls falling over brings me so much joy because they don't brace, man. There's no like kind of anticipation of what the kind of it's gonna happen in the next few seconds. Anyway. Whew.
Let me take it all in. Let me take it all in. Let me relax, 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 relax. Anyway, so this has been the Agus Show episode number 92. Is it 92 or 91? 92, 91. One of them anyway. Um, thank you for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. I love you guys as always. It's been three days again. We've done it. I've achieved it. Number one in the books. So I guess I'll see you guys again next week. Maybe I'll have a bonus one this weekend because I'm off this weekend, which is a fucking rare treat. Um, that's nice. Um, so I'm going to use my time wisely as I get a weekend off to prepare my stuff for the other events I have coming up. Develop some pictures. You know, I've got loads of shit to do. Loads of shit to do. And most of it you guys are going to see, such as my developing the pictures. I'm going to be able to upload my Tumblr, which I haven't updated in a while. And also going to back some stash up some images that I'm going to upload on my Instagram once I come back on my Instagram on the 31st of August. I'm going to have a party, actually. I'm going to have my coming back to Instagram party on the 31st of August. You guys should come and um, join, join in with that. I'm going to live stream that. Actually on, I'm not even joking. I'm going to live stream on Instagram, my return to Instagram. I'm going to have a whole little party. It's going to be on my, on, on my own doing fat lines of coke drinking and shit. Do you know what I mean? It's going to be fucking nuts. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, man. I guess, you know, Zinger Show, episode number, whatever it is. Thanks for tuning in. Um, if you're on the podcast, please leave me a five-star review. If you're on the YouTube watching, like and subscribe, share with your mates, all that nice, sweet stuff. As always, I'm going to be DJing this Friday at Tap East for a night called Tapped. You can find the details below on my website, xnozinger.com. It's a flyer on there. I'll be playing loads of disco, funk, soul, R&B, hip-hop, and all that nice malarkey. And then I'll be playing, I think, the subsequent weeks as well. You got, you see the flyers on my... You see the, everything listed on my DJ gig section on my website. So go to the link below, xnozinger.com, DJ gigs. You'll see where I'm playing. And then on top of that... I'm also playing somewhere else on the Bank Holiday Sunday of Bank of Notting Hill Carnival. I'm sure you guys are some guys that uh, live in London looking forward to that shit. It's going to be hot and sticky and that. Um, Blicky with a sticky aunt. Should be good. Um, and then after that, what else do I have? And then, and then, and then. Oh, going to Bristol, Berlin. Nice little holidays coming up soon. But I'll talk about that later. But yeah, man, it's been the Excellent Zinger Show. It's been a great week of podcasting. I feel, um, I feel great. I feel nice and limbered up now i feel like i've got these hours in pockets now i've got this in my pocket i can bang out hours of podcast like an hour on top and then now the next mission was to kind of get to the hour 30 minutes without me having any um gaps in silence with that malarkey so with that sound being made it's actually a Zinger show um thanks so much for tuning in i'm, I'm glad you tuned in I'm, I'm glad to have you guys watching wherever you may be um spread it like it tell your friends tell your family tell your sisters Oh, and as always, if you want to support me and buy me a beer, link in Patreon too. Link that. Link that below. Link below. Click that. Submit. Donate to the man. Them. Let me drink a couple of beers on the weekend. Feel me? This has been the Agostino Zinger Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. And I'll see you again very soon. Peace.